Hello everyone, my name is Peter Holden and I am going to be your instructor for Canadian Business Law, BATM 107. Now I've been told that this is the new normal, but as far as I'm concerned it's the new abnormal. Um, we have rapidly switched from class um, uh, teaching to online teaching and for some instructors, uh, younger, more um, uh, familiar with technology, that is a fine thing for us older instructors, particularly one like me, who's a bit of a dinosaur. This is turning out to be a real challenge. So um, my lectures um, will be by video and you will see my bobbing head and this by the end of the, the term is going to drive you crazy. Um, I like the classroom dynamics. I like being able to walk around. I like being able to ta ask students questions. I like being able to scribble things on the board. Um, we're, I'm not set up for that um, because I'm working from my home, so you're going to have to suffer through these videos. Um, while they tend to be dry, the content is really good, okay? I have had over 30 years of practicing law in corporate commercial, um, as well as in other areas, and so I am confident that the content is wonderful. The presentation is terrible. For that, I apologize, but there is a real plus to this. Uh, well, a number of pluses, actually. The first thing is, it is impossible for you to miss a lecture. If we have classroom lectures and something happens and you miss a lecture, it's very difficult to catch up. Um, but you don't have to worry about that. So uh, you just go online when it's convenient for you at a convenient time and location and you watch the video. Wow, that's good. Um, also, it allows you to say, wait, sorry, what did the instructor say? And you can back it up and listen to it again. All right. Um, so that's, that's a tremendous advantage. And then you get to the point where you're preparing for the examination and you're looking through your notes and you went, oh, gee, I don't understand that. Uh, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to email the instructor. Oh my gosh, it's the weekend. Oh, am I going to get through to him? No, you don't have to worry about that. You just go back and look at the video, okay? I'm going to put them on and I'm not going to take them down. Um, so, uh, you know, that's the, that, that's the big advantage. Now, I must apologize for something else, and that is I suffer from terrible allergies, okay? Um, I am allergic to seven different types of common grass plus other pollens. This is the worst time of the season for me to try to, um, to give you a video. Um, this is the second time I've done this whole portion, and the reason it is, I went back and looked at it, and I was going... <coughs> Uh, you know, uh, 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 hi, uh, my name's uh, Peter, uh, uh, and I, it was driving me crazy. Okay, so I'm redoing it. Um, hopefully this will be a little bit better all the way towards the end. One portion at the end has to remain the same, and you'll probably hear my voice sort of like this. So I am, uh, I'm taking allergy pills, and um, uh, coffee helps, so I'm going to be sipping coffee as I go, and hopefully that'll, that'll work out. What I'd like to do today is I want to go through the chorus syllabus. Um, I want to talk about myself, um, uh, my, my background and everything. And why? Well, because at this point in your educational career and life, when you're in a seminar, when you're in a classroom, when you're listening to some sort of presentation, a couple of things should go through your mind. First of all, does the person standing there have the credentials to deliver the material and number two can I trust the materials or does this person have biases prejudices and maybe an agenda that isn't clear okay so I think I'm going to tell you a bit about my background for that reason um, then I want to get into um, the uh, course format a little bit um, I want to talk about the evaluation profile um, and the lecture schedule. This video will conclude with the portion that I'm not going to redo, and that is I'm going to spend some time um, trying to convince you that this is not a law course. This is a business course. Um, what's that? What do I mean by that? Well, I'm, uh, years ago we were re-engineering our whole department, and we just looked at everything we were teaching and decided what we could throw out. And I was astounded 
<laughs> the other instructors said, well, you know, we don't need to teach law because, you know, law is something you get at law school. And I went, whoa, okay, uh, we're going to re-engineer me right out of a job. Then we listed on the board everything that we could cover. And amongst other things, they listed, oh, we have to know about contracts. We have to know about forms of business organization. We have to know about the use of insurance. Um, we, you know, we have to know about, you know, tortious liability. And I went, whoa, 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 wait, wait, people. What do you think it is I teach? And they went, well, you, you teach law. And I said, that's the law. And they went, oh, okay. So if the other instructors don't understand that this is a business law course, it may not be apparent to you, and I'm going to spend some time doing that as well. All right. So uh, you can bring up the uh, course syllabus on your screen, and then you can watch my bobbing head to the side, or you can um, just bring up the syllabus and listen to my voice in the background. All right. So your, your choice. Uh, the syllabus starts off with... Um, uh, with, you know, the name of the course and, and things like that. Well, the first thing I want to get to is the instructor, um, Peter Holden. I want to talk about my educational background, my work background, and my teaching background. Um, I have uh, three degrees. I got a, a BA in Canadian History and Political Science from the University of British Columbia and thought, woohoo, what do I do with it? Uh, I can either teach or work for the government. Um, I didn't want to do either. Yeah, I know you're looking at me and saying, hey, uh, Professor Holden, you're teaching, so uh, what happened? Well, life throws cur curves at you. Um, I am teaching, but not teaching um, in, well, for me, in the normal sense. Uh, I'm not a high school teacher. I'm not just a university teacher. I am a legal practitioner who brought teaching law to the classroom. So it's a bit different. Um, and then working for the government, well, one of my very first jobs was, uh, gosh, working for the government. Um, but that only happened for a short period of time, and, uh, uh, <clears throat> and then I changed uh, directions. Okay, so I got my BA, um, and I want, always wanted to become a lawyer, um, but I, I was told that I should maybe, maybe join it with an MBA because I wanted to go into corporate commercial law, and that would be a great combination and it turned out to be the MBA allowed me to teach okay so I went to the MBA faculty two years it was really really intense it was great uh, the problem with the MBA is about halfway through your second year the headhunters come to the university and they want to hire the MBAs so I actually had a job before I completed the program which made writing my big uh, paper at the end very difficult I kept saying well, why am I doing this I've got a job um, but I got my MBA, and by that time, uh, I'd started at a college and then transferred to university, and transfer credits meant I'd been going to university for five years in my undergrad, and then two years MBA. That's seven years. That was too much. I was poor, um, and I was tired of university, so I took a, a five-year hiatus and uh, worked at some really interesting jobs, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and then I went back and got my law degree. So I got my MBA and my uh, BA at UBC, um, and then I applied to law schools. When I did that, I used the shotgun approach. I applied to six. Um, I was accepted at uh, UBC. I was accepted at Dalhousie, and I was accepted at University, West Coast, East Coast, Central Canada. I covered the country. Um, I had to choose which one to go to, and um, you would think I'd choose Dalhousie because it was the um, one of the top universities in the country for law. Uh, no, I chose the University of Ottawa because at the same time, my wife, who had been working, wanted to go back to school, but she wanted to go to theater school. She got accepted at the National Theater School in Canada. They take, what is it, like three males and three females a year? I mean, it's really really hard to get in there. So she was um, very, very successful. That's in Montreal. Well, McGill turned me down. I applied to McGill to go to law and they said, would you be willing to take courses in French? And I went, uh, gosh, no, I want to pass them, right? So they looked at that and they thought, okay, we don't want him. So the University of uh, Ottawa uh, was the closest I could get to her. And that'll come back uh, into play into something I want to talk to you about, about how, how to pass this course. Um, 
Okay, so th those are my three degrees. Um, I think getting a, a, a law degree from the University of Ottawa didn't hinder my legal career at all. Um, I, because I think I, I had pretty good grades and I got involved in extracurricular activities, which you should think about doing. Okay, that's my education. Uh, now let's look at my work experience. After the MBA, um, I was hired by a crown corporation, and that's the government, so it wasn't exactly working as a civil servant. Um, and the Crown Corporation, the, um, the Industrial Development Bank, is designed to be a lender of the last resort to give loans to businesses who couldn't get them through the uh, regular lenders. Uh, it was supposed to be a risk taker. Um, it wasn't. Um, I found it a very stifling atmosphere to work in. Uh, but it was good in the sense that I had all this business education in the MBA program. And that job as a credit officer... Uh, doing business plans with um, potential um, customers uh, cemented the knowledge that I had learned, practical application of my education. It was great that way. I couldn't stand the conservative atmosphere. Um, one, one little example, I was working in my office one day and I was working on a very complex loan proposition. So I closed my door and the manager comes down and opens the door and says, what are you doing in there? And I went, what? I'm working on a loan. He goes, well, you know, you shouldn't work with your door closed. And I went, why? You know, and, it's, and so the, it was a very stifling atmosphere that way. And I decided that two years was as long as I was going to work there. Anything shorter than that. And somebody might say, what, can't you hold a job? Anything longer than that, and I might be tainted with that um, conservative banker attitude because it was supposed to be a lender of the last resort, but in fact, it was very hard to deal with, and you, they were just like terrified of having a bad loan. Uh, and most of the people working there came from the chartered banks, which are not risk takers. So two years to the day, I quit, surprised everybody in the office because I told them I was going to do it, and they wouldn't believe me. I hate a government job, good pay security, pension, like what more could you ask in life? Um, not for me. So um, I quit and I went back to Ottawa. Um, I had uh, done a little bit of um, involvement in politics and um, I made some contacts. And so I went back to Ottawa and worked for a very short period of time with the Legal Research Bureau in the House of Commons. And the National Legal Research Bureau is a group of, of young people um, who, uh, a member of parliament, didn't matter what party, uh, needed some uh, research done. They don't have the staff to do it in Canada. And so we have this bureau, and I would write up uh, memos for these people. Very quickly, I was uh, hired by the Minister of State for Small Business. It was a new ministry, and it was, um, uh, the minister was Len Marchand, uh, Senator Len Marchand um, now passed away, um, but he was the first native Canadian to um, be in the Senate. And um, th this was a, a great opportunity. He had an executive assistant, a political assistant, a legislative assistant, and he needed a business assistant. Wow, right up my ad ad avenue. Um, I want to... Uh, uh, I want to be involved in business um, and law, and uh, here's the Ministry of State for Small Business. I had top secret clearance. That is pretty cool. Um, any document that goes to the cabinet for the cabinet ministers to talk about, so there's Justin Trudeau with all his ministers and they're talking about stuff, um, they're secret. And um, I got to see them before they went to cabinet and got to write memos to my minister about what things affected small business ministry or what things they should try to do. Pretty heady stuff. Traveled around the country in uh, jet stars, you know, private jet, with the, uh, you know, steward coming down and saying, may I refresh your drink, Mr. Holden? And, uh, you know, would you like the Nor uh, New York Times or do you want the uh, Financial Post or <clears throat> things like that? Uh, Travel around the limousine, stayed at the best hotels, and... Um, I've got to get up on my soapbox here. Now, during class, I'm allowed to give my opinion on things. I should deliver the course materials, no opinion, no agenda. But when I do have an opinion to give, I get up on my soapbox. And I'm going to try to remember to tell you that so that you know it's my opinion, not part of the course material. 
okay, here's the first time I get up on my soapbox. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't, th I don't think we should begrudge our members of parliament or our cabinet ministers from traveling first class, from staying in good hotels, from riding in limousines, um, and, uh, uh, and having pretty nice meals when they go out. And the reason is they work incredibly hard. Okay. Um, I was, I was amazed at how hard they work. Now, I don't think all of them are actually very productive. All right. Um, but um, a lot of them are productive and they work very hard. They live in Ottawa. Their families are scattered around the country. They're traveling back and forth whenever they can just to see their kids and wife, husband. <clears throat> and, um, uh, and then, you know, they travel and they, they do a, a, sem a government seminar in one town and that evening they have to go out and do a political thing. They work very hard. So I don't begrudge them that. Um, now, if they overdo their expense account, then I think they should be taken to task on it. But generally, I, d I don't have a problem with it. I also had the pleasure of working for a very nice man, Len Marchand. <clears throat> um, he would use a Jetstar um, only when it was absolutely convenient and it was government business. Um, one time he had to fly down to Montreal from Ottawa. Um, and uh, so he said, uh, Peter, would you come with me? And I said, sure. So the, the department, the government, um, <laughs> arranged my flight and uh, he arranged his and he was flying economy and I was flying first class. So he took me to task on that. And I said, hey, listen, I didn't do it. But, you know, so I, I had my ticket reversed and uh, learned a lesson that way. Anyway, he was really good to work for. Worked for him for a year. Then there's a cabinet shuffle. He goes off to the Ministry of the Environment and I went to the Minister of National Revenue uh, Senator Joe Gay from Manitoba, um, a French-Canadian uh, senator, um, very hard to work with. Um, uh, he, uh, <clears throat> he fired his staff all the time. I started off working in his business assistant. He fired his legislative assistant and said, Peter, you're doing that now. Uh, no extra pay. And then he fired his political assistant, Peter, you're doing that now. And so I was actually doing three jobs. Um, I figured out how to survive with him, though. Okay, um, and that was at the end of the day. He was a very lonely man. His uh, wife had passed away. Uh, at the end of the day, um, he's very lonely. So I would walk over to his office in the Senate building uh, from my office in the House of Commons. And he said, and I'd say, uh, so, you know, hello, Senator, how are you doing? And he'd go, oh, you're fine, Peter, get a drink and sit down. So I'd sit and have a drink with him at the end of the day. Um, and we would watch the news on TV. And because of that contact... Um, I managed to survive when the others were dropping like flies. One year, bang, <laughs> another cabinet shuffle. I'm back to the Ministry of State for Small Business. So um, the Honorable uh, Tony Abbott became the Minister of National Revenue and the Minister of State for Small Business. So I was back there, you know, running that side. Um, and that was a really good year because we did seminars all across the country and, and, and it, was, uh, it was quite exciting. However, political job, right? Um, so there's an election coming up and um, I did the numbers and I realized that the government was going to fall, number one. And, and number two, uh, my cabinet minister was going to lose his seat in Mississauga. So I went in to see him and I said... Um, uh, uh, Tony, I've you know got some bad news, and he said, "Yeah, I already know." And he said, "I've got my next job lined up. What about you?" And I told him I wanted to go to law school. I got my BA, my MBA. Worked for five years. I want to go to law school. He said, "Okay, do you need a letter of reference?" And I said, "Yes, that would be very helpful." And he said, "Okay, you write it. I'll sign it." <laughs> okay, now I want to write a letter that suggests that I'm capable of walking on water. Okay. Um, on the other hand, I knew that he was one of those ministers that actually reads his mail. You know, some of them it goes to this executive assistant. The executive assistant reads it, and if it's okay, he just gives it to the minister, and the minister signs them all. He reads them, and so I thought, uh, I want to make it sound glowing, but I don't want to sound like an idiot. So, But it was a tough letter to write, one of the toughest I've ever done. But it turned out to be a good letter, and he signed it. I got a letter from um, Senator Gay, and I've got a letter from Senator Marchand. And then I went to the... Um, lawyer that taught me this course when I took it in my undergrad at UBC, um, and he'd become my mentor. And he, 
uh, during my law career and he or, uh, education and then early career and uh, he was an extremely talented lawyer that did property law uh, mostly um, he uh, he was entertaining in the classroom um, and just a, a nice man and and uh, he gave me lots of good advice um, towards my legal career as well so he gave me a letter of reference so I had you know all my ducks in a row and applied to law school went to law school um, now here's here's something that I want to make sure you know and that is that I am not academically strong okay um, I, I struggle with exams um, I have uh, you know difficulty memorizing but I got good marks at, um, at law school and uh, and I was the uh, men's sports rep. Um, I was uh, I did uh, legal uh, work as an assistant um, uh, with the Crown. Um, all all sorts of activities. Oh, I was the captain of the men's hockey team, the B hockey team. Okay, <laughs> not the A hockey team that played other universities, but the B hockey team, and we played other faculties at the University of Ottawa. So I had a I had a really good time, and the reason was I. Had worked for five years in business, and so I would go to the university early in the morning, take my classes, and stay there and study until five o'clock at night, and then I'd go home. Okay, so I was treating it like work, and um, I found that by the time the exams came around, um, I had my material well taken care of, and so I would go to bed at ten thirty at night. Whereas other students who were cramming at the end. I actually had a call a couple of times, like two in the morning, and they were, you know, other students asking me questions. And I was saying, oh, you woke me up. And they said, you're kidding. They were doing all-nighters. <clears throat> they were taking pills, uh, you know, uppers, and uh, things like that to try to get through. And, you know, as long as you apply yourself, you're going to be okay. So I got my law degree, um, and I'd lived in Ottawa for six years. If anyone knows anything about the weather in Ottawa, um, it, it is brutal. Okay, the winters are long and cold and miserable. The spring is over like that and all it is is wind and, and dust from all the sand they put down to, on the roads to be able to drive. Um, the summer is hot and humid. The fall is nice as long as you're in Ottawa. If you go out into the countryside, the bugs are like... Whew. Anyway, I'd had enough of Ottawa. Um, I wrote my uh, last exam on a Friday, mid-May. Saturday, I was on a plane back to uh, Vancouver. Um, and I articled, articled with a medium-sized law firm, Ray Connell, Lightbody, and Reynolds. It was a great firm to article with. What is articling? Um, articling is you learn the law at law school. That's the academic side. You learn the practical side of the law during articles. You write your bar exams on various topics because I had to now get up to speed in BC law specifically. And you get to go to court on small applications. You get to carry the briefcases for lawyers that are arguing cases. Um, and you learn, uh, at, well, look at it this way. At, at law school, you learn how to argue a case before the BC Supreme Court. In articles, it tells you how to find the courthouse. Okay, that practical. Okay, you start an action, you have to file documents. Where do you go to do it? All right, well, they teach you that. You want to help someone buy property, you fill out the documents. What do you do with them? Well, you file them at the land title office. Where's the land title office? Things like that. So the practical side of the law. So I did my bar ads, passed them all, got called to the bar in 1983, okay? Um, I walked across the stage in the Supreme Court house downtown in my robes, and the Chief Justice said, rrr, 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 rrr. Uh, he mumbled, and I had no idea what he said, but I suppose he said, congratulations, you're called to the bar. Began practicing law, didn't have any clients, um, and I was hired by a sole practitioner uh, who did a lot of pro property law and wills in the state, so it was not my cup of tea. But pretty much anything that came in the door, I did. Um, I did criminal work, didn't like that. Don't like my clients. They all seemed to have money to pay the bills, but I didn't like them. Young offenders didn't like that because young offenders know more about the law than the lawyers and the judges generally. They A lot of them use the system. Family law too stressful. 
uh, one of my best files, billing-wise, uh, was uh, early when a woman came into my office and she sat down and I said, how can I help you? And oh, 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 oh. she started crying. I went, oh my God. And I'm handing her tissues. And this went on for like 20 minutes because she was going through a divorce and she was really upset about it. And I kept thinking 20 minutes, that's uh, one third of an hour uh, at $175. And I was figuring out how much money I was making handing her tissues. And then I could bill for the tissues as a disbursement. So I just... I'm being a little facetious, but I didn't like family law. Um, property law, wills and estates, too rudimentary, too, like always the same, right? So I wanted to do corporate commercial. Um, wasn't getting much of it there. Um, that sole practitioner had a heart attack, goes in the hospital. I'm running his law practice. Right out of law school, right out of the bars, I'm running this law firm. And that was really stressful. When he came back from the hospital, he wanted to sell his practice to me. And I said, no, I don't want to do that kind of law. I moved to another firm where I did more corporate commercial. Um, it, uh, it was a small firm. Uh, didn't, uh, didn't really enjoy it. And then I got an opportunity to join as an associate in a three-man law firm uh, downtown, um, Mackay, Dwar, and Turlock. And I'm not being sexist when I say three men. It was three men just three lawyers and myself. Uh, one did marketing and advertising law as a specialty, one did franchising as a specialty, and one did intellectual property as a specialty. And then they needed someone to do the grunt work, you know, uh, incorporating companies, taking care of the corporations, uh, drafting contracts, um, and going to court on, on various matters. And so I got that grunt work. And that was good. Worked there for quite a while uh, and then became a, a partner with that firm. Um, and you'd think that being a partner is uh, like the pinnacle of your career. You know, uh, talk to a lawyer and you say, so are you, are you looking forward to being a partner? Oh, I don't want to be a partner. Odds are they're not being totally honest. Okay, most of us think that, uh, you know, becoming a partner is, is you know, then you've, you've succeeded. Okay, I talked about how um, uh, your presenter might have biases and um, here's one of them. Um, I made money as a partner. Um, but it was not the be all and end all that I thought it was going to be. Uh, the firm was incredibly badly managed. Um, our office manager um, didn't have the credentials, and we'll get into that later on. Um, and it, so it was. It was always a very stressful uh, time period, and um, it <laughs> the partnership exploded because of those pressures and others. Um, and so uh, at that point. Um, my career took a really interesting turn and I'm just going to take a short break here um, and we'll come back and uh, talk about. Okay, back after the break. I had to have that break because I needed to get more coffee. Um, I probably drank too much coffee. Anyway, um, I became a partner and um, every once in a while during my uh, videos. I'm going to say, you know, how I've lived a very fortunate life, and I generally knock on wood. Um, it's it's true. I have had a very fortunate life in many respects, and uh, this is one of the times when you can just see how fortunate I am. Uh, I had. Um, oh, by the way, why do we knock on wood? In ye old English times, uh, if uh, you said something nice. Um, there was a superstition that the sprites that lived in the woods um, would would do something nasty. So if you said, oh, I'm fortunate, I have a nice son, your son would be struck down with, uh, you know, a plague or something. Um, and so because the sprites lived in the trees, if you said something nice, you would knock on wood and then they couldn't hear you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> not likely to be the case, but I figure if knock on wood helps, uh, you know, or may help, then it, you know, like, why not do it? <laughs> anyway, um, uh, <clears throat> I, um, I was working as an associate before I became a partner, and um, I got an opportunity to teach this course at Capilano uh, College, as it then was, um, just to explain, um, this course is identical to the one that they teach at UBC. And I took that UBC course in uh, my undergraduate degrees and really liked it. And I took the 
you know, the advanced course, and I really liked it. And I became a marker while I was in the MBA for uh, Peter Watts, who was the instructor for that course. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, I thought, wow, I don't want to teach, but it would be kind of fun to teach that course, okay? Well, I was fortunate enough to get the opportunity. Apparently, Bob Mackay, the senior partner in the firm, had done some evening, evening teaching at uh, Capilano University, Capilano College as it then was, and uh, they called him up and they said, uh, you know, Bob, are you available to do some more teaching? Well, no, 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 I'm a partner. I'm far too important, far too busy, but I do have this lowly associate in the firm that might be interested. And then I found out, yeah, same textbook that uh, we used to use. Course outline was identical. The content was the same. So I taught um, in the evenings for two years. Um, and then I became a partner. And they asked me if I would come back and do it again. So I guess I was doing something, right? Um, and uh, I said, um, well, I'm interested, but I have to talk to my partners. We'll get into uh, partnerships in uh, Chapter 7. And Section 32 of the Partnership Act says if you do anything in the name of the partnership, the money has to be split between the partners. So I went to my partners and I said, um, I was going to do this teaching in the evening and I just want to make sure that you didn't have any objections. And he said, oh, no, that's fantastic. Yeah, go ahead. You know, we'll be getting the partnership name out and, and maybe getting some clients. And this is just wonderful. And the money. And I said, well, yeah, but the money isn't great. And they said, well, yeah, no, well, you know, uh, it all comes into the partnership and, you know, well, we get one third. So that's good. And I went, what? And that was it. They they expected the money to come into the partnership and they were going to take one third each and I was going to be left with one third. Well, all right, I love teaching this course, um, but I'm not going to do it for one third of the salary. Simple as that. So I declined. Um, then I became, you know, then, um, you know, a little later on, the partnership explodes. Uh, I came in one day and uh, the senior partner said, well, I'm going to Russell and Dumoulin where I'm going to become a partner and, you know, a big wig. And the other one said, I'm going to Swinton Company. I'm going to be a partner in a big wig. They went to those firms and apparently their performance wasn't as good as they thought because neither of them got to be partners. Okay. So anyway, our, our partnership explodes and I'm going to be a sole practitioner, which is a whole terrible ball of wax. I have to suddenly find premises. I have to hire staff. I have to get a bank loan by myself, um, you know, and all buy equipment. And, and I thought, oh. And Kaplan University calls me not a month after the partnership exploded, not six months after the partnership exploded, three days after the partnership explodes. Kaplan College calls me and says, we have a full-time teaching load here. Would you like to do it? Well, yeah. So I went out and I had an interview with Greg Lee, who was the Dean of Business then, and then he became the president of Capilano uh, College, and then as it became Capilano University. Um, and he became a client of mine, actually, and then uh, he's uh, retired now. And I had my interview with him, and about halfway through the interview, uh, Mr. Lee looked at me and he said, Peter, I sense some reluctance on your part. And I said, well, yes, I really am interested in doing this teaching, but I, I really don't want to give up the practice of law. And he said, why would you want to do that? And I said, whoa, okay, here's one of those interview questions that is really difficult to handle. A business is going to hire you full time and they want you to have a job on the side? I mean, it just didn't make sense. So I didn't know how to answer. Finally, I thought, yeah, honesty is the best policy. And I told Greg, I don't understand. This is important to you. Okay, this part of the story. Um, he said that nobody teaches in the School of Business at Capilano College unless they also practice in their area of expertise. So I'm going to teach business law. I better be practicing business law. Somebody's going to teach you finance. They better be practicing as an accountant. Someone teaches you marketing. They better be doing some marketing out in the, in the real world. Um, and that's that I think gives you a tremendous advantage, okay, because not only are you going to get the academic material from the textbooks and things like that, but you're also going to get practical knowledge of somebody out in the workplace. There was one point um, in early years when I was working there, um, the dean came to one of the instructors and said, uh, Tony, you're taking a year off without pay. And he went, what? He says, it's just come to our attention that you have done no consulting in your area of expertise for nine years. Go out and get a real job. 
you know, and he had to. Um, and then uh, I, I look at my MBA, which was really good. UBC is a very, very good school. Um, but I had a marketing instructor who had um, never had a real job. Okay, he taught marketing out of the textbook. He used examples out of the textbook. Well, I use lots of examples of case law that occur out in the marketplace, but I have a lot of anecdotes which shows you how certain aspects of business law actually work in the marketplace. Um, other instructors do the same thing, so this is a big plus for you. Anyway, I got to do both. I got to practice law and teach. Um, I began teaching. I did uh, law one and law two. Okay, that's all I did. Um, well, eventually, um, I had an opportunity to begin teaching international trade law. And I also, because of my MBA, taught Management 101. And I'll teach it again next summer after a couple of years hiatus. Um, and I teach um, uh, entrepreneurship, BATM 268. Okay, I have taught international trade law in Vietnam for Capilano University. They sent me there and uh, gave me a ticket home, so I guess I was doing okay. Um, that was kind of interesting because there, um, all the students, uh, when you walk into the classroom, they all stand up. Now, they knew English, okay, um, uh, because I don't know Vietnamese. But they'd all stand up, and they would not sit down until the professor said, to do so. And so the very first thing I learned was Sin Chao Moi Noi, which was, hello, sit down. And they would applaud. Okay. And then I got to teach in English. So I did that. Um, and uh, that was, that was really uh, an interesting experience. Um, okay. So I have gone through, well, I'm not quite finished my law career. One of the interesting aspects of my law career is that um, I became a sole practitioner I associated myself with a, a business downtown rather than start my own. I was teaching at UBC in the uh, executive MBA faculty for uh, two terms in the evening. I was teaching at Kaplan University and having an intimate love affair with my car. Okay, I'd get up in the morning, I'd drive to Cap, do my teaching, I'd drive downtown, I'd do my law work, I'd drive to UBC, do some teaching, drive home. Um, it was very, very difficult. So um, the UBC teaching stopped because it was I was teaching because someone was on sabbatical. And um, uh, my wife, who had become an actress, um, professional actress, and had decided to stop and, and got a job as a manager in a um, business, uh, had been burned out, took some time off, was at home, and said, Peter, move your law practice home. And I went, <clears throat> What? And she went, what? And I said, if I don't have a three-piece pinstripe suit, a briefcase, and a downtown office, who's going to take me seriously as a lawyer? And she said, why don't you ask your clients? And so I did. And the bottom line was they didn't care where I was. I could be on the face of the planet Mars. Um, all they wanted to do was be able to get in touch with me when they needed me. So um, I moved my law practice home. And um, had a rule. Um, I did the banking. We'll get into that a little later on because um, uh, you want to make these kinds of uh, business connections. Um, and I also answered the phone, you know, Peter Holden. And the client would go, oh, oh, is that actually you? Because they'd expect to go through the receptionist and wait online for quite a while. So um, uh, it, it was very successful, um, actually, because the, the overhead was low. I was making more money, and it was the best managed law firm I've ever had. And I'm not saying that just because my wife is my business manager. I, if I didn't say it, she'd kill me. But, no, I'm saying it because it's true. Um, anyway, uh, it, uh, <clears throat> it was an interesting way, but I was still, you know, a little embarrassed about it. And, you know, somebody would say, well, where's your office? And I'd go, in my home. And they'd say, what? And I'd go, in my home. Um and I would go and visit my clients as opposed to having them drive to see me most often. Uh, but it was, it was, I was still a little bit worried or, you know, embarrassed about it. And, and one day I got a call from a lawyer and he goes, this is Jeremy and my sweet the third and, you know, let me speak to Peter Holden. I thought, oh, my goodness, what, what files this on? And like, it sounds pretty serious. And I said, speaking. And he was, oh, are you the guy that works out of your home? And I went, yes. And he said, What's it like? And I said, pardon? He was sitting in his car in the middle of the Lionsgate Bridge for the umpteenth time in a traffic jam, 
and had it. He lived in West Vancouver. He drove downtown, and he said, I've had it. I want to move my law practice home. So I told him how to do it. Um, a short while later, an accountant does the same thing, and suddenly I realized that um, as far as my bet and 268 entrepreneurship class goes, um, I had brought new technology to an old profession. Okay, now new technology isn't just some sort of you know you know buzz thing like a, you know external hard drive and you know a new computer or, or your cell phone. New technology is just a new way of doing something. Okay. And I was successful at it, and so I had a number of people call me and ask me how it goes. That's the good side. The bad side is my wife and I adopted two children, and um, working out of your home, the kids don't understand that, oh, dad's at the office. All right. So one time I was with a very um, serious um, uh, uh, business client, and I was you know, talking to him, and my little daughter, who was about four years old, burst into the room, waving a piece of paper, saying, Dad, I have my affidavit. <laughs> and I went, oh, no. But the uh, business person just looked down. He says, whoa. He said, uh, you know, I have a hard time pronouncing that word. Um, so he was impressed rather than upset. Um, and I'm also fortunate because I um, have been able to have clients that I like. Okay. Most people have to take the clients that come in the door. Um, but I have, you know, had clients that I like, and so I had a really good relationship with this person, and he didn't mind the interruption. Um, one more anecdote about uh, doing business out of your home, which is becoming incredibly more apropos with COVID-19. Um, and that is... Uh, uh, a lot more flexibility as far as your hours go. Um, I had a client in Australia negotiating a contract, and he said, um, and I've been on the phone with him numerous times. So finally he phoned me up and he said, Peter, um, I, I need you to be online with me uh, tomorrow when we sign this contract because I want to get your input at the last minute. And I said, yeah, sure, no problem, Rick. And he said, no, 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 it's going to be a problem. And I said, why? And he said, well, the time change. We're doing this in Australia, and it's going to be 5.30 in the morning your time. I said, no problem, Rick, just give me a call. He said, oh, really, you're sure? And I said, yeah, no problem. Of course it was no problem. Now try that with a downtown lawyer. They'll, they'd, they'd have to get up at you know, 5 in the morning and you know drive to the office, and you're paying extra for for all that service. <clears throat> but um, I was in my office. So my wife and I wake up at 5.15, we get up, we go downstairs, the coffee maker's already on, we pour our coffee, we go outside and we get in the hot tub, okay? And we're watching the sun come up, drinking coffee in the hot tub, and she's got the phone. And uh, the phone goes off, we turn off the jet, she answers the phone, Peter Holden's office, um, and she said, I'll check if he's in, are you in? And I said, yes, I'm in the hot tub. She hands me the phone, and I helped my client negotiate the last part of a contact contract, sitting in my hot tub, drinking coffee, watching the sun comes up. You tell me if that's a good way of doing business or not. So there are tremendous advantages. Um, all right, so um, that is uh, the law career. Um, I just uh, stopped practicing law on December 31st, 2018, um, but I do continuing legal education seminars so I will be able to remain up to speed uh, with new uh, developments in the marketplace. Uh, teaching, I've already told you about my teaching. Um, I, I won't tell you how many years I've been teaching at Kaplan University. You just look at my gray hair and give it a guess. Um, okay, that's enough about me. Now, we have this thing called um, office hours or as they like to call it now, coaching hours. And um, that's going to be impossible, COVID-19, which is causing this connection. Um, no face-to-face. -face. So um, I used to encourage students to come into my office and sit down with me or meet with me right after class. No can do. Uh, I am in a high-risk category, um, and I am... Uh, uh, in ice, isolation on the Sunshine Coast, and we've got this moat that's keeping uh, COVID-19 at bay. It's called the, uh, uh, the water between uh, Horseshoe Bay and Gibson's. Um, so how do we do this? Well, do not contact me on eLearn, okay? I find that awkward as heck. Um, I have an email. It's on the course outline. You have a question, email me. 
Um, <clears throat> that's the best way, okay? Now, you could phone and leave a message, and I could access my phone messages at Kaplan University, but there's going to be all sorts of delays, and that system doesn't seem to work very well. Email me, okay? Email me. No problem. I respond very quickly. The, uh, the next portion of the of course outline is the school business uh, vision statement and our mission statement. Um, we did this long before other universities and um, even Kaplan University did. We were a business uh, school and so we decided we should have a vision statement, a mission statement. Um, now everyone else is, is doing pretty much the same thing. Just read that. Course prerequisites, none. Course format, obviously. I am going to teach by, by videos. Now, there are reviews for exams and reviews for um, the uh, contract assignment that you're going to do and things like that. And I'm going to um, work with IT services and see if I could do something online so that we can uh, do something face-to-face. -face. But the lectures, okay. Um, so there's some, um, uh, you know, the, let's see, five chapters that we take, three, four, five, six, six chapters. Okay, so there'll be, you know, uh, a couple of videos on each one of those. Um, then we get down to the required texts and resources. We used to use a very, very good law textbook. The problem with that was it was about $180 plus taxes. Uh, and that was too much. And the reason it was too much was because the textbook was thick and we only used about half of it for the course. So it seemed to me and the other law instructors that this was not good value for your money. Um, the other problem with the textbook was it was trying to be the textbook for all law schools across Canada, which means that they do a generic version and then if you're teaching in BC, you have to explain, well, it references the BC uh, or the Business Corporations Act for Canada, uh, but we use the BC Business Corporations Act. You know, well, they, uh, you know, do this, and well, but in BC we do this. And, <clears throat> and so there was those difficulties. Um, students were reluctant to buy it, um, and the secondary books market was, uh, was awkward as heck. So... Um, the law instructors were looking at using another textbook, you know, less expensive. The problem is when you start getting into less expensive textbooks, they're less expensive because usually because they're not as good. Um, so uh, I had a, a half a textbook in my bottom drawer of my cabinet from a few years ago when I was teaching in tourism as well as the School of Business. And one of the tourism instructors said, Peter, let's write a textbook. You can use it for BAT M107, and I can use it for the tourism, and you can use it for when you teach in tourism as well. Um, so I wrote half my textbook, and she didn't get around to writing hers. Um, she was a single mother, uh, two uh, boys. Uh, she's doing admin work at Capuano University, plus teaching. She just didn't have the time. So I had half a textbook there, <clears throat> and uh, what I did was I gave it to the other law instructors, and I said, okay, look, here's half a textbook. If you like the format, if you like the, the readability, then, you know, I will do the other appropriate chapters, and we can start using it. And the, uh, they all took it, and they read it, and they said, okay, sure, fine, that, that looks great. And the advantage of this is that it's going to be designed for the course at Capilano University, rather than being designed for, let's try to cover every university and every topic in the country. Um, and it's also half as expensive, okay? Um, so I wrote the textbook, and the first thing I have to say is I do not make very much money on it. Okay, so um, I'm going to tell you to buy it, but I'm not going to tell you to buy it because I'm going to make a lot of money. And the reason is that in order to get it published, I had to give copyright to a publisher, the publisher produces it and gives it to Kaplan University, and the publisher takes most of the money. Uh, so anyway, there's a little less self-interest there, although I do make a little bit of money on it, and gosh, I should because it was a lot of work. Here's the problem, okay, um, and it's not a serious one. Uh, you get three lawyers in a room, you get four opinions, 
Okay, that's that's a joke. Um, but what I mean is lawyers take a long time doing things. They're very careful. And so this was about May and, or you know, even earlier, sort of like mid-April. And I said, let me know because I could do the work and we could start using it in the fall. Well, they delayed and they delayed and they delayed, they delayed, they delayed. And pretty soon I, I, I said, okay, guys, you got to give me notice because otherwise there's no way I can get it done in time. So they said, yes, we agree. Go ahead. So I rushed to get it out for, this, uh, for September 2018. It came out and it had errors. Okay. Not errors in content. Content. The law is solid. The errors were spelling errors, grammatical errors, um, some minor errors in the diagrams and things like that. Um, and so we started using it and we told the students what the errors were, okay? And uh, to ignore the grammatical errors and the spelling errors and just um, concentrate on the content. That was the first printing. Um, I then uh, very quickly went through and got rid of most of the errors uh, and they came out with a second printing. And then I thought, okay, now I've got some more time. Um, and so what I wanted to do was, when you write a textbook, you think, oh, you know, I could have handled this better and maybe I should have added this and, you know, that is important, I should take it out. So I had three topics. Um, I didn't cover the rule of law well enough, okay. And I didn't, um, I decided I should handle um, union management conflicts a little differently. Um, and then there was um, uh, one, other th one other thing I wanted to change slightly. And so I, I thought, okay, well, what I could do is I could do a second edition. That means if you buy this textbook and it's the first printing or the second printing, you will never get a chance to sell it, okay, because there's a second edition out. So I thought rather than do a second edition, uh, in the third printing, I'll make the corrections and then I'll hand out sheets for those people that buy it used um, and they have a first printing or a second printing, they just have the sheets. And so page uh, eight um, in this book is fine. Then I added page 8A, okay, and then you go to page nine, okay? So page 8A is the new material. So, and then um, another place I said, okay, replace pages 58 and 59 or something like that with the new 58 and 59. So you can actually get free updates and you can still use the older textbooks. That means that for this term, you can, if you can find someone to sell it to you, buy a first printing or a second printing and I will put those corrections on eLearn and then you'll have the material that you need to be completely up to date. If you buy the third printing, then you're okay. How can you tell? Well, on the inside cover, if it says nothing here, then it's the first printing. If it says second printing, like this one, then you know that you need the update. If, um, but a cautionary word here. We are in the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic. If you buy a textbook from another person, you are risking getting infected, okay? because the virus stays on surfaces for a long time and you will have to interact with somebody. Here's the book, here's the money. So I'm not recommending that you buy a used textbook. Some students are still doing it, so do it cautiously if you do it, okay? But in the bookstore, they are selling the third printing. Not only that, the bookstore says if you go online and you do it now and early, then um, you will <clears throat> be able to get free shipping and or free pickup, uh, you know, and then you don't have to go in lines. If you start buying your textbook, I'm going to open up the um, uh, eLearn site right away today. If you go on um, uh, eLearn, uh, pardon me, if you go to the bookstore to buy your textbooks in the first day of classes, think about it. Um, you'll have to social distance, like, you know, two miles with all the other students that are going to be ahead of you. So order it online and um, you'll be able to get it quicker. Now, I, I designed this textbook for this course um, and I'm trying to do this carefully because when I did the first um, 
video and now I'm repeating it, uh, you can hear the pages. Um, the table of contents, you can see there's uh, chapters one to nine. Um, the only two that we do not use is um, chapter five and six, okay? So we use the whole textbook. The other thing is get to know your textbook. For example, there's a business scenario at the front. This is a, a complete business scenario for a, a, a fictitious business that I worked up. Um, now, most universities say, well, when you buy a widget or you sell a widget, what's a widget? It's a made up product. Well, I have a made up product with a whole made up business scenario. Why? Because if you look at the scenario and you relate it to the material, you'll understand the material better. Okay, so there's a business scenario. You have to read that right away. Risk management. There's a short section in there covering risk management. What is that? When I was teaching in tourism, they called their law course risk management. And it dawned on me that that's what I did as a lawyer. Okay, um, I had long since stopped waiting for clients to come into my office with a problem. You make lots of money. Oh, I'm being sued. But I began to be proactive with my clients and say, let's look at your operation and let's see if we can um, prevent you from being sued. And then let's see if you do get sued uh, because of some disaster like uh, the pandemic. Um, maybe we can make you judgment proof. OK. And so I realized I was doing pre uh, risk management. I just wasn't um, talking about it that way. And so I began putting risk management into my lecture guides um, and eventually actually the textbook in their later editions, the one that we don't use anymore, began to talk about risk management. So I thought, okay, good. I'm a little ahead of the curve. Um, so there's the, uh, the, the risk management section, it's very short. And then we get into the material and as we go through each chapter will have a small scenario that relates to the chapter and um, the questions at the end of the chapter relate back to the scenario uh, quite often to show you how actual business interactions um, affect legal uh, matters and vice versa and how we should handle them. There is a good table of contents are, are at the beginning and there's a good index at the back so if I'm talking about a declaratory judgment on my video and you go uh, he didn't explain that well enough you go to the index you look at declaratory judgment it says gosh go to page 11 you go to page 11 and here we are and oh look it's in bold so that you can find it quickly and understand it <clears throat> there's a table of cases and there's a table of statutes so if I'm talking about the um, uh, the Competition Act and you want to uh, see a bit more about it, you look in there and it gives you the page number where it's discussed in the book. If I'm talking about Regina versus Dudley and Stevens, that's obviously it's a court case. You go in and you look in the table of cases and you can find that and you can use it. So it's a good tool, okay? Uh, it's a good tool as long as you learn how to use it. Um, oh, I, I, one other thing is um, <clears throat> the artwork, Okay, so you see this particular picture here, and there are other pictures, um, not very many, um, but there are other pictures in the, uh, in the textbook periodically. Those are done by my um, second oldest daughter, um, Alexandra. So here's one on contracts. Um, so, uh, you know, kudos to her. Okay, so that's the textbook. Uh, this, the exams will be open book, so uh, gosh, you might want to get the textbook and read it um, because, and, and then have it available for the exam. The other thing is uh, lecture materials, all right? Now, these are available in the bookstore, and I used to say optional, and people would say, oh, optional, well, <laughs> I'd rather spend money on, a, you know, some burgers and, and uh, a dessert at uh, you know, some restaurant rather than spend money on this thing. Well, it's only a couple of dollars, and um, I don't think it's optional because in here there are um, articles and cases which help us understand better the topics we're covering. Um, there is a copy of an insurance binder. 
when we talk about binders of insurance, you go, okay, uh, he explained the definition, but I don't know what it means. You can look at one. Um, there is a tort problem on page 37, which we will be doing um, in preparation for the exam. And there's um, a contract, uh, a little short contract review on um, page uh, 39, and we'll, uh, we'll go over those. Two other things that are really important is um, last year's uh, midterm exam, term last, yeah, last year's midterm exam, November 19, 2018, when I taught this course, is in here. Why is that important? Well, it's important because I'm going to use the same format, um, and this gives you a heads up. It's also important because it allows us to do a, re a review session before the exam, um, and we'll, we'll go through the Part C on this. Now, Part C on the <clears throat> midterm exam is a scenario, and you have to go through and pick out the legal issues and the principles. This is difficult to do. And the best way to do it is if I explain during a review session how best to answer it so that you get maximize your marks. Um, and then we'll use this so that you can understand what you're looking for. The uh, final last year was a little different. I, um, rather than just giving you a business scenario and asking you to find the legal issues, I actually gave you a scenario and then I would put in blank lines where the issues are, and you just had to identify them. Not going to happen this year. Um, this year, um, we are going to online exams, um, so they're open book, and that means I am expecting more from you um, because what I wanted you to do is be able to recognize um, legal concepts in these previous exams because it was a short time period. Now, uh, open book, um, if I just said, you know, recognize it, you would just look in there, find a term, put it on, and you wouldn't learn anything. So what I have to do is assess how much you know, and so you're going to have to give much more detailed answers. So the way it'll work is I will open up the exam at a certain time period. You'll have two hours, two and a half hours to do the exam. At the end of two and a half hours, you have 10 minutes to email it back to me. If you don't email it back to me, you get zero. Okay? Um, so, and then, and then I'll mark them online and give them back to you, and then hopefully we'll have time in the course to have a quick review session so you understand where you went right or where you went wrong. Once you get it back, you can certainly email me and ask me questions. All right, so that's the lecture material. Now, oh, pardon me, no, one other thing is um, in here, um, starting on page um, 40, there's statutory material for the BC Business Corporations Act and the BC Partnership Act, both of which are really important. So why should I say on the exam, memorize the relevant sections? Because in life, if you need to, you can go and look them up. Okay. So during the exam, you'll have those and you will be able to look them up. So if there's a partnership um, question and it deals with a partner doing work related to the partnership and he has to pay that money to the law firm um, to be divided up amongst the partners, um, I will expect you to not only explain that that is the law but reference the section, okay? So it's in there. Oh good, I don't have to do anything but then turn up for the exam and when there's a question like that, um, find it. Let's see, where is it? Um, uh, that's on page uh, 3, uh, no, 40. Ah, uh, here it is, 44. Okay, there's section 2, section 7, section 2. Oh, here it is. You don't have that much time, okay? So you have to familiarize yourself with that beforehand. So before the midterm exam, we will have a review session looking at the midterm exam from last November, and before the final exam, we'll have a review session online, COVID-19, blame that, don't blame me. Um, anyway, um, the for the final exam as well, all right? Uh, so this is, you know, not optional. Okay, your textbook isn't optional. Um, that doesn't mean you don't have to buy it. <laughs> I mean, I mean, if you don't want to buy it, you don't buy it, right? I mean, I can't force you to, so... Um, 
the uh, <clears throat> that'll just be uh, your choice. Um, but we'll get into that a little later on because I want to talk to you too about how to pass this course. Okay, so there are um, additional readings posted to Moodle. Very few. Okay, very few. Um, there will be assignments posted to Moodle. And when we get into just before the quiz at the end of uh, the term, um, there will be some material uh, that we discuss in class uh, that I'll post that relates to the uh, quiz, but very, very little else. All right. Um, in the... Um, course outline we get to course learning outcomes um, read that that's more uh, for our approval of our uh, course syllabus um, within the uh, umbrella of universities and things like that what's important to you though will be the topics the course content and yeah the course content is um, uh, relatively um, well, it's complete and everything, but I don't think you should refer to it, okay? I've put a lecture schedule on eLearn, and that is a blow-by-blow. Blow. This week we do this. This week we do that. Here's when the assignment is. Here's where you hand it in. Here's when the exams are. So you should uh, you should look at that. Uh, the assessment is obviously one of the most important things <clears throat> as far as you're concerned. And four things. One is a midterm worth 30%. Then we have a contract drafting assignment worth 25%. We have a uh, quiz worth 15%. And then we have a final worth 30%. Heavily weighted on exams and quizzes because this course is transferable for credit under the CA program. You want to become a chartered accountant, you have to take this business law course. They dictate that 75% of the grade must be by way of exams or quizzes. Okay, so that does leave me 25% to play with, and I have, draft, uh, I have drafted a, uh, a contract assignment that we'll get into in a minute. Um, okay, so um, uh, <clears throat> the, the quiz is only 15%, and, um, well, I should back up. I should go through the contract assignment. Um, during your life, you're going to be drafting contracts, sometimes formal, sometimes informal. Sometimes you don't even know that you're drafting a contract. You're just doing business, okay? So I want, I want to talk about what goes into contracts, what lawyers do for you when they draft contracts, and what you can do when your lawyer is going to draft a contract to reduce the cost of the legal fees by being able to provide relevant information. Um, this assignment is really difficult to fail, okay? Um, some students try, and some stu students um, succeed in failing, but as long as you do um, an attempt, a, good, a decent attempt at getting this assignment done, you will at least get around 65%. Work a little harder at it, and you're in mid-Bs, okay? You, you sort of take this on, and you say, okay, I want to do a really good job. You can get a first-class mark. I give you a scenario, I give you a precedent. You use the business scenario to use the precedent to draft the contract. That's what lawyers do, okay? I have a precedent. It does not fit every contract in the whole world, but I have a good contract precedent. You come in with your particular scenario and ask me to draft a contract for you. I put it into that precedent and I take out things that are irrelevant to that scenario and I put in things that are relevant to that scenario and then I give my client a, um, a draft and they review it. Okay, so that's what you're going to be doing. Um, it, uh, it sounds relatively straightforward because I give you the precedent and I give you the scenario, but you, you really have to work at it. Um, it takes about... We had, to, we had to give the university some ideas, so I said eight hours. Okay, um, I don't think it would take you eight hours, all right? But that's, that might be the average for those that... Um, uh, that just sort of, you know, do the basics and, and then those that spend a lot of extra time in it and then those that spend little time on it. So it averages out, I would think, to maximum eight hours. If you're hitting 22 hours, um, get in touch with your instructor because you're off the rails, all right? So what will happen is you'll draft the contract assignment and you'll post it online. I'll mark it online. I'll send it back to you. Then there will be a review video, unless I can learn quickly enough how to do something um, online with all of you, which would be difficult when there's 40 of you. Um, and then uh, <clears throat> I will uh, wind up um, marking, uh, you know, 
giving you this extra material um, during that video lecture. Everything discussed in the video lecture and that extra material will be the only material on the quiz. And the quiz, I haven't figured out how to do this one yet. In the past, it was a two-pager, fill in the blanks, 20 minutes. You could have a half hour if you needed it. Um, and it was worth uh, 15 marks, okay? It provided an opportunity to pick up some ground if you did not do as well on the midterm exam and the contract assignment as you hoped, okay? That does not mean it's easy. Please listen, it is not easy. It will be short and snappy, but you have to know the material. The good thing is that it's a finite amount of material. When we review the contract, that information. Then I hand out um, and go over some things that you should know about drafting contracts. That's it, okay? So you look at that finite amount of material, you write the quiz, you should be able to get a better mark. Um, students don't. Why? Because they don't take it seriously. Some because they don't really care as long as, as long as they pass the course, and others because they think, ah, oh, 15 marks, how hard can it be? It's hard, okay, but it's manageable. All right, and then you, and then you do the final, and bingo, the course is over. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and then I think the rest of the uh, course outline you can just read. It's the standard material. Um, I'm serious about cheating. I generally catch one or two people cheating during the year, and um, uh, and I I you know I don't give you a, a second chance. Okay, I I give you a zero, and I report you to the university. Um, if you want to challenge that, you can. Uh, oh, but and one of the ways that I catch people cheating, of course, is um, in the contract assignment. You can do it yourself. You can do it in teams of two or you can do it in groups of three okay so um, what will happen is uh, a team of two will draft their contract assignment and a team of three will forget or delay or procrastinate or whatever suddenly it's almost due and they come and they go, oh help us out help us out can we just see what you've done <clears throat> and these team will say okay you know here's our memory stick you know take a look at what we've done well they're going to take a look at what you've done and they're going to copy it, okay? And I'm going to get 15 to 20 assignments. Oh, well, a precedent. I use a precedent, the same scenario, and I'm receiving 20 of them. How can I possibly know that people cheated? Well, lots of ways, so don't do it. <clears throat> um, the idea is the group of three can talk amongst themselves and do it themselves. The teams of two, talk amongst yourselves, do it yourselves. The team of three, hands in one. The team of two, hands in one. You do it by yourself, obviously you hand in one. Um, I have a marking guide I'm going through, and I go, oh, wow, that is really the weirdest thing I've ever seen. <clears throat> A little later on, oh, wow, there's that same weird mistake. And then I go back and I compare them. And I can tell very quickly if one group has given their work to the other or if they did it together okay so um don't do it okay don't don't cheat um all right enough said about that let's um uh, turn to the um uh how to pass the course and what i'm going to do is i'm going to pull up something from the um e-learn and I'll see if I can minimize it yeah to the left of the screen so that I don't miss things and then I'll put this up I, I put up a piece of paper because I, I'm videotaping and gosh I'm so dashedly handsome and so interesting that on a photo booth I see myself and I watch myself and I don't look at the um, camera and so you see me talking to you know something else so I put something to block my handsome face and that way I concentrate on the uh, camera okay so on eLearn there's something called how to pass the course and I apologize if you are a good student and you look at this and you think well how condescending to think that you have to tell me that um, for you I apologize uh, the rest of you um, I think it's a really good idea if you pay attention how to pass a course 
Attendance. Okay, well, we don't have classroom attendance to worry about, um, but what you have to do is you have to actually go in and attend my videos. Um, if you don't, you do so at your own apparel. <clears throat> I teach from a lecture guide, which is on eLearn, um, and you can bring it up, and there's all my slides, okay? Um, this is an idiot's guide. Not that you're the idiot, I'm the idiot. This guide tells me these are the things that I have to cover. That way I will least I'll be less likely to miss something, okay? So um, you look at this lecture guide and you listen to me. Oh, well, everything's on the lecture guide. Like, what do I have to do? I'll just read it. No, because the lecture guide, only a certain amount of information can go on there. So I teach a lot of things that supplement that. And if you don't take notes, then you're only getting half the information. The other thing is, I'll be going through there and there'll be something that I didn't put on my screen. Like, good standing. Corporations have to be kept in good standing. If I talk about it and I say this is a term you should know, then if it's not on the lecture guide, you'd better take notes because that'll be on the exam and you won't have it. Okay? So, follow the lecture guide, do the videos, take notes. Cell phones and computers. Um, I used to be called the uh, computer slammer because I would walk around, lecture, I liked the, you know, mobility in the classroom, and if I saw someone and they were on their computer and they're going, <laughs> um, obviously, um, the, I think the course is interesting, <laughs> but it's not that interesting, and it's generally not all that funny. So I know that they're, you know, playing the NFL game or they're texting with their friends or something, and I'd walk by them, and if I saw that it wasn't schoolwork, I would slam the computer shut. Um, so I became known as the computer slammer. Um, don't do it. We don't have to worry because we don't have classrooms. All right, textbook. I've already talked about the textbook. Buy it. Read it, okay? Buy the textbook. Um, I've got a couple of cartoon pictures on there. One shows a, a carpenter and he's gonna, uh, he's gonna hit a nail but the head falls off the hammer. So you don't buy a textbook, it's like being a carpenter without a hammer, okay? Um, it's like, a, you know, being a volleyball champion and, yeah, I'm going to spike the ball, but you don't have a ball. Okay? Well, it's, you don't have a textbook. You're putting yourself at a disadvantage. It's only $80. $80? Oh, man, like that's like, you know, totally, ah, that's too much. And yet you'll go out on the weekend with friends and you'll have um, a dinner somewhere and drink somewhere and you'll spend 80 bucks. Okay? Um... So if you can afford to do that sort of stuff, or if you can afford to buy a $5 coffee, you know, 10 days in a row, um, then obviously you've got the money to buy a textbook. If you don't, you can get them secondhand if you can, being careful about the virus. Um, so, uh, you know, buy the textbook, okay? Um, because it's a tool to help you get through the course. If you get the textbook, okay, wow, I got it. Now, what do I do with it? Well, you know, it's a good paperweight um, I'll just, you know, put it on top of all my papers. No, read it, okay? Read it either before you do the lecture, but probably best after you do the lecture, okay? Um, uh, and that will help you fill in the blanks. It will also flesh things out because I only have a certain amount of time on the video, and so I tell you the, the, the skeleton. Well, that's the flesh, you know, so uh, do that. There are questions at the end of the chapter, um, which are designed to work with the scenarios and give you the idea that you should um, uh, uh, know from the, from the chapter, okay? So if you do those questions um, and email them to you, or to me rather, I won't answer them, okay? Um, I'm not going to correct them because I, I have too many students. I couldn't possibly do it. If you email me the questions done by you, I will email you my answers. Now you've got your answers and my answers, you compare them. You're going to learn more that way. So you see what you should have had and you see what you do have and you think, hey, I've nailed that. You get to another one, oh, oh okay, I've got to work better on that one. You get to another one, say, I don't understand what Peter's talking about. Then you email me and you ask me a question, then I will answer that. Um, very few people do them at the end of the chapter, and then, um, gosh, you don't get as good a mark in the course. We have practice problems. 
we do the um, video on torts and then we do a practice tort problem a uh, two-pager that has just about every tort imaginable in it and then you can see how the um, academic part works into a business scenario um, you don't do it ahead of time oh, it's, it's okay Peter's gonna do it and well, look at that he's gonna give me an answer guide like why do I have to do that I'll just take the answer guide into the exam and <laughs> you know I'm looking at an A no you're not you want to know why because you'll you, you when I answer them you go oh yeah okay sure there's um, uh, battery oh yeah there's the false oh yeah there's a definition yeah yeah oh, okay on the exam I'm not there giving you the answers and you'll have a harder time finding them so you do the practice problems ahead of time you'll do better on the exam index cards this is how you can really actually pass the course um, index cards on one side of the card and I give you an example standard form contracts and the other side it says a contract um, uh, entered into a on a take it or leave it basis okay so um, I got through law school with index cards um, in my criminal law class uh, there were about 25 sections of the criminal code that you absolutely 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 had to know um, I put them on one side of the, uh, the section on one side the definition on the other I'd carry them around okay it's not good enough just to do the cards but my contract assignments standard form contracts uh, contract entered on a take it or leave it basis, um, the uh, you know all all those things, and I carried them around with me um, I, in, in my coat pockets, and everybody thought I was about 180 pounds. Okay, um, but what I would do is I'd be going to the university, and I'd get to a bus stop, and I'm waiting for the bus, and waiting for the bus, and waiting for the bus, and waiting for the bus. No, I'm not. I'm at the bus stop, and I'm going through my index cards, standard form contract, take it or leave it basis. Yep, you know, and and I'd practice them. Um, <clears throat> on, I told you how my wife was in uh, Montreal and I was in Ottawa. Uh, on Friday after my last class, I'd get on the train. I'd go down to uh, Montreal to spend some quality time with her. I could be on the train. I could sit in the bar car and have a beer. Um, or I could uh, be on the train in the bar car having a beer and doing my index cards. Get down to uh, Montreal. Go to my wife. Going to spend quality time. Her idea of quality time is... Let's go shopping. Now, okay, guys, yeah, we generally don't like shopping. But I'd go with her. We'd go in a store. The clerk would come up and, hi, can I help you, sir? And I'd go, yes, do you have a chair? Yes, one right there. And I'd sit down on my chair. Thank you. And I'd go through my index cards. My wife would come out and she'd say, oh, what do you think of this dress? And I'd go, oh, wow, sweetheart, that is you. That is just, you know, beautiful. She'd come out with another one. And I'd go, mm, no, I don't think it does anything for you. Not that I really knew, okay, but I had to show that I was interested, okay? Just kidding. Anyway, um, I do those quiz cards. At the end of the law, I had a whole table full of them, but um, it got me through the exams really well, particularly because on part A of my exams, 15 terms, I give you the definitions you have to match, okay? You should be able to just fly through that, okay? Use those index cards, you can do that. Now, here's the kicker. Um, there's no point in doing them and not practicing them. I had one young lady come in last year and she said, I don't understand, I did so poorly on the midterm exam. I said, let's see your index cards. And she pulled them out and I thought, oh my gosh, she has the index cards, what went wrong? I said, well, you know, so, you know, did you study them much? And she goes, and I said, when did you do them? And she said, well, I did them, you know, the, two days before the exam when I was studying. No, that's not when you do them. You do them as you go along and you practice them as you go along, okay? There's no point doing them at the end and not studying them. Well, I mean, I suppose it helps a bit, but not as it should. Try this. Quizlet. Um, everybody likes to be on their phone and they're looking cool and how many likes have I got and, you know, hello, ho, and, you know, texting. And, um, and so um, you can actually get this program called Quizlet and um, it's like a card, okay? On one side you put the term and then you hit a button and it flips over and you can see the reverse side. So you can actually be outside sitting in the sun going, and everything's, oh man, look at how popular that person is. Look at them. They're texting. Oh man, I wonder how many likes he's got. And you're studying and nobody knows it. Okay? I'm just kidding. Okay. Uh, but you can do Quizlet. 
um, you know, you're high tech, I'm low tech, I use cards, you use your uh, phone. For the midterm and final exam, we have those practice exams in the, um, uh, in the material and uh, the lecture guide. And I say, you know, on, you know, what you're supposed to be doing on the lecture schedule, do part C of last midterm exam. And then the next class, uh, the next um, time there'll be a video, which I will release. Uh, it'll be hidden and then I'll release it. Um, and then you can um, uh, look at the video and look at the part C, see how well you've done, listen to me talk about it, and you will do better on the, on the midterm and final exam. If you do them, you will do better um, if you look at the videos and don't do them, uh, you know, because everything helps. But if you want to get a good mark, that's the way to do it. Okay, then there's um, the last two asking questions and coaching office hours. Um, <clears throat> in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, new abnormal. Um, <clears throat> ask questions. Uh, you used to do it in class. Now you just do it online. Okay, you email me. Uh, coaching hours, we don't have them, so you just email me. Uh, okay, and then the last thing on that particular um, uh, s slides on the uh, eLearn is uh, two uh, footnotes to the above. Um, one is um, if you miss a class, then uh, what you have to do is get the notes off somebody else and uh, then ask me questions. Don't contact an instructor and say, uh, I missed last class, did we do anything important? <laughs> I, I never teach anything really important, um, <clears throat> except that uh, the law class is probably one of the most important classes you'll take. And I know every instructor says that, but I mean it. And here's why. Um, let's say you want to go into marketing. Uh, okay, so um, is law important? <laughs> oh, you know, marketing. Well, there's the Competition Act, there's the Business Practices and Consumer Protection Act um, that all regulate marketing and advertising. Okay, well, I, okay, I don't know if I'm not going to do marketing. I'm going to be an accountant. Like, what do I need law for? Um, well, accountants do judgment calls. It's called uh, making representations with respect to financial statements and, uh, and to tax uh, planning for businesses. Um, if they make a negligent misrepresentation or a negligent omission, they get sued. Um, these are torts. It's law. It applies. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to be, um, uh, you know, doing uh, HR management. We will do a chapter on HR management, which shows you how the law impacts it to a tremendous degree. Well, I'm not going to go into business. I'm just taking this as an elective. I'm going to, I'm going to you know, just like teach at uh, high school or something. At some point, you're going to want to buy a house. It's a contract. You should know something about it. Um, there is nothing in law, uh, pardon me, there's nothing in your life that you can do that isn't impacted by the law particularly in Canada, where we are very highly regulated. So this is a very important course from that, from that standpoint. Um, but uh, you, <clears throat> you don't have the opportunity to ask me questions except online, but you should do so. All right. Now, the last note is really important. I want you to pay some attention to that. Um, for the last few years, I've had people come in to me and they would say, um, I failed the exam and, you know, and I've, I've got 47 out of 100 for the year. Can you just give me three more marks to, so I can have a pass? I'm um, warning you right now, my answer to that is no, okay? Um, uh, because I have to ensure that you know sufficient amount of the course material to at least get a pass, okay? I don't want people going out saying, I've got a degree from Capilano University and I know absolutely nothing about business law, okay? I mean, that doesn't do the reputation of the university any good and it doesn't do your reputation any good. Um, so when you come in and you say that, uh, no, okay? Um, if you say, oh, you know, I got uh, 46, is there a little bit of extra work I can do that I, you know, I can bump, bump my mark up? My answer to that too is no. Okay, and the reason is doing a little bit of extra work to bump your mark up is well, I might as well just give you the marks and let you bump it up. Okay, you're not going to learn sufficient in the material for me to be comfortable to say that you should even pass. Um, and the other reason that that is unfair is um, they say, oh, can I have a couple more marks? Well, what about the person that got 58 
and would like a C. Oh, can you just give me a couple more marks? No, you don't deserve them, okay? Um, well, you know, I, I, I need a C plus because it's a prereq for another course. Can you bump me up? Oh, sure. It's a prerequisite, prerequisite for another course. That means that you should know this material to be able to handle that material. Oh, just bump me up. I don't know the material, but I, I'm sure I'll do okay in this course. It doesn't make sense, okay? So I don't want you to be in that position. Um, it, because it, I feel badly for you, all right? Um, and the other thing is, I don't think that it's fair to other students. Um, <clears throat> somebody works hard and passes, and anybody can pass this course, okay, if they work. You can. Um, and so if you don't work, um, if I said, oh, I'll bump you up, um, gee, I should bump them up, and then I should bump the other people up, and then I should bump the other people up. And well, you know, I bumped you up to a C, but maybe I should bump you up to a C plus. And pretty soon the grades become meaningless, okay? Um, so um, do those other things, and you will pass the course, um, really work at it, and you can get uh, B, B plus, um, you can get um, an A, all right? Um, but don't put yourself in the position where you're going to have to come in and, uh, you know, beg for assistance. Two reasons. I'm sure you don't feel good about it. And secondly, I'm not going to do it. Okay, so that's how you pass the course. Um, and I think um, <clears throat> now I'm going to end there and I'm going to just check to see if um, I've touched on everything I want to. Um, and then the last portion of this video will be um, how I explain that this course is actually a business uh, course rather than law course. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. All right, in this next portion of our introductory lecture, I want to talk about how this is a business course, not a law course. I mentioned that a little earlier. And the way I do it when I have a lecture with the class is I hand out a sheet to everybody and it has a picture of a fellow sitting at his office desk and then around the outside, there's numerous cartoon drawings of things that can happen during a business day, which have legal consequences for the business. So I don't have one of those sheets. I have them all prepared, and they're at the university, and hey, I'm in the Sunshine Coast, keeping my social distance, so I cannot get my hands on it. So what I've done is I've taken some pictures off the internet, just to give you the idea. So here's the fellow sitting at the desk at the start of his day, and around him are all sorts of pictures. There's one of a truck that says Joe's Trucking, and it's hit a tree. And then there's another of a check, and we'll get into that one specifically because it's important. Um, there's a uh, coffee cup. And then there is um, a rest in peace, uh, a bit of a gruesome uh, one, uh, particularly in the context of today with the coronavirus. Uh, and, and then the other one was um, uh, some pictures of books. Now here's the actual books that I was talking about in that uh, cartoon. So I thought I'd show them instead. And then what I do is I ask students to choose a topic or a cartoon picture and I would talk about the business consequence that relates to it. Um, and for example, if they picked the gruesome one, uh, then I would talk about how you should have certain documents prepared to have your state in order, considering that um, there's a potential that uh, you uh, may die. <laughs> Everybody's going to die. Unfortunately, with, with the coronavirus, um, some people are dying earlier than they should. So if you're a business person and uh, you contract the virus and you're put on a ventilator and there's almost no chance of recovery. What about your business? Uh, you know, how, who takes care of it? Uh, if you pass away, um, how does it get sold? Those sorts of things. You have to have documents related to uh, taking care of your estate, both your personal one and for your business. And for businesses, it's called a secession plan. What happens afterwards? Um, the uh, Joe's Trucking, um, if someone chose that picture, um, what this is, is um, a situation where you have a business, and uh, whether it's incorporated or not, but particularly serious if you're not incorporated, 
and you have an employee who goes out driving your delivery truck, hits that telephone pole or tree and um, is injured, um, uh, or worse still, causes damage to somebody else's property or perhaps causes a car accident. Um, it's his fault. He was the one that was negligent. And yet you as the owner of the business will find out that you're responsible to pay for all those damages. Doesn't seem fair, but the attitude of the courts is that the businesses have a deeper pocket than the poor employee. And as long as the accident occurred during the course of his or her employment duties, then you as the business are responsible. Now, if it turns out he's on a frolic of his own, so for example, he's on a, um, a delivery route and he makes a decision to go off and um, <clears throat> uh, go to a fair and, and something and, and injure somebody, that's not part of his duties and so then you would not be responsible. But you are responsible in all other circumstances. Then there's the... Um, uh, the the books one. Um, I, I particularly like this one because um, what happened was years ago these four books: The Cat in the Hat, Mr. Brown Can Moo, Can You, Doctor Seuss, One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish, and Green Eggs and Ham came bound up to me in the mail, and I didn't know what it was and I ripped it open and by then the packaging was destroyed and inside it said congratulations and right away I knew there was a problem. <clears throat> congratulations, you've been selected to receive these four books. If you want them, write us a check and pay the enclosed invoice. If you don't want them, wrap them up and mail them back. If you don't wrap them up and mail them back within a two-week period, uh, then you must pay the invoice. No. We have the Business Practices and Consumer Protection Act in the province of British Columbia, which says if you receive, as a consumer, goods at your home, then you are entitled to keep them and not pay for them. And you cannot be sued by the business. Why is that? Well, these books are sent to us. Why? Because I wanted them? No, I didn't even know about them. As a matter of fact, we received them B.C., before children. Uh, we uh, subsequently had uh, two children, but at the time we received them, I opened them up and I went, what? Like, what the heck? <clears throat> I kept them because when my wife Kathleen gets sick, she's in bed, she's like, oh, I feel so, so horrible. Read me a book. I thought, okay. And I'd pull out one of these books and read them. Then eventually we had kids. My kids love them. But I never paid for them. Because I, as a consumer... Um, if I receive those books at home, the business is preying upon my ineptitude. Okay, What they're thinking is, number one, people receive them and go, Oh, wow, just what I always wanted. And they'll pay for them. Or they'll go, Oh, for crying out loud. Oh, what's the, oh. all the problems sending back. Oh, well, Christmas is coming. <coughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give them to my niece and my nephew. And they'll pay for them. Or thirdly, they'll wrap them up and at their own expense, which is considerable nowadays at the post office, send them back. Or the people will go, okay, I'm going to send those back. How dare them do that? And then they'll forget. And two weeks will go by and they'll go, oh, darn, I had to send them back within two weeks. I guess I have to pay for them. And they'll pay for them. Why would it be two weeks? Like, who made that rule? Anyway, <clears throat> and then there's the last group people who know the law, particularly lawyers, who went, hey, this is unsolicited goods. Section 12 of the BC Consumer Protection or Business Practices and Consumer Protection Act says, I can keep those goods and not pay for them because I'm a consumer. Now, I'm a consumer because I consume goods. As a lawyer, I run a business, I consume ink, I consume paper, I consume toner for my photocopier, I consume electricity, <clears throat> but I'm not considered at law a consumer because I'm not the end person. My client who gets the legal services would be the consumer. Okay, So you receive unsolicited goods as a business, you have to deal with them. Okay, You can't keep them without paying for them. Anyway, that was one of them. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Oh yeah, and then there's the, the coffee cup. Okay, 
Um, I, I, I started when I started doing this years ago. I put this on as a bit of a joke because what I thought was, well, um, I can uh, uh, put that on, and one of the students says, uh, Professor Holden, tell me about the coffee cup. I go, oh, thank you, and I ah, take a drink of my coffee, and I say that was a joke because um, it's just uh, my way of uh, remembering to drink my coffee before it gets cold, ha, 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 ha right? <clears throat> but the law caught up to me. You may recall years ago now that a woman in the United States went into McDonald's, bought coffee, spilt it on herself, sued, and got a million dollars. Well, um, <clears throat> I'd spill a little of coffee on myself for a million dollars. <coughs> what happened was um, she and her son went in, drove in, and got stuff, and they got back in the car, and they say they weren't driving, but she took the coffee cup and put it between her legs to get the lid off, which is a pretty stupid thing to do, right? Spilled the coffee, <coughs> suffered considerable injuries. Uh, lots of pain and suffering, skin grafts, um, and, and she sued and she got a million dollars, and that made big headlines. Suddenly, businesses all over the world that weren't involved in the court case found that it was costing them money because everyone then had to immediately put warning labels on their coffee cups. You know, warning, hot coffee, like, duh, right? Anyway, um, <clears throat> big headlines. When it was appealed, the Court of Appeal overturned that decision. So one judge says... McDonald's, big corporation, lots of money, poor woman, give her a million bucks. Way out of line for the injuries sustained. I mean, the injuries are nasty, but not a not million dollars worth. So they reduced it to about $83,000. Wow, <clears throat> that's still a good chunk of money for spilling coffee on yourself. Except by that time, that amount of money would cover the cost of medical and the legal expenses. So she walked away with nothing, in effect. Didn't make big headlines. Lower court judge does bad thing. Court of appeal does right thing. Doesn't get the press. <clears throat> but it is interesting in two respects. One is it's American law. We don't generally follow American law in Canada. And number two, down in the United States, juries not only say liability, but also say quantum. In English law, British and Canada, jury says liability, judge says quantum. So we would not get an award that large. As a matter of fact, the outcome would be substantially different because in the lecture guide material, <clears throat> I give a little excerpt from an English case where a young man goes in to McDonald's, buys coffee, spills it on himself, and then sues for a lot of money. And at trial, the judge said something along the lines of, uh, well, Mr. So-and-so, you're uh, 34 years old. And he goes, uh, yes, I am. And he said, and when did you start drinking coffee? And he said, oh, about uh, age 17. And he said, so for half of your life, you've been drinking coffee, and just now you found out it was hot. So he got nothing, had to pay his own lawyer's fees, had to pay party and party costs, which means part of the law fees for McDonald's, <clears throat> um, uh, and uh, the case was dismissed. So we follow the English law as opposed to the American law. So that was one of the interesting ones that shows how something as simple as a cup of coffee can cause conniptions for your business during the day. However, the one that I wanted to talk about specifically, and out of all these cartoon pictures, um, this is the only one that you're going to have to remember for examination purposes, and more importantly, for the contract drafting uh, project that you're going to have to do. So we have this this check, but let's let's make it worth more. <clears throat> let's say it's an eighty thousand dollar check. So you decide to start a manufacturing business to um, make a product, and the product is irrelevant. Um, <clears throat> you decide to um, make the uh, product, but you have to buy supplies. Well, that's a later step. 
First of all, you have to find premises, pay your first and last month's rent. You have to get the equipment in. You have to hook up hydro and pay for it. You have to hook up um, uh, water and uh, <clears throat> all the other services. You have to get your computer system in. You have to hire employees. <clears throat> you're doing all this. And you're rapidly running out of money. So finally, when you're ready to start making the product and you have to buy supplies, you have no money for supplies. So what do you do? Well, at that point, you go to a supplier. In this case, it's called um, Manufacturing Supplies Corp. And you say, I want to buy supplies, and I'll pay you on 30, 60, 90 day terms. And this is your check, and so you fill out the check. And up here on the check, the bank very kindly puts your corporate name, your address, your phone number. Down here is where you sign it, and up here you date it. But you're going to date it for three months later, right? So <clears throat> right now it's uh, May the 11th. So it would be June, July, August the 11th. July, yeah, August the 11th. So it's called a post-dated check. It means the bank should not cash it for three months. Well, banks make lots of mistakes. They're run by humans. And um, the... Uh, I, I, this this is an aside. This is an additional um, uh, free legal advice for you. If you ever do a post-dated check, what you do is you put in the date here, August the 11th, and then you circle it. Okay? And then the bank teller gets the check and goes, huh? What? What's this? Oh, this is post-dated. And then it's less likely they'll actually cash it before the date that's due. Anyway, you fill out the check, and down here there's a signature line. So you sign it to uh, Joe Smith, president, because you're president of your company. Um, so when you decided to go into business, you very wisely went and talked to a lawyer. And the lawyer said, um, uh, you know, what I want you to do is, um, uh, I just need a little piece of paper here. Um, I suggest that you form a corporation, okay? This is your corporation, and you'll be the sole shareholder. You will elect yourself as a director, and you will appoint yourself as an officer, the president. And the nice thing about that is, when it comes time to contract with <clears throat> um, the manufacturing company, the contract will be between your company and the supplier, not between you, Joe Smith, and the supplier, okay? The good thing about that is there's this thing called the corporate veil, which says that <clears throat> on August the 11th, if for some reason you cannot pay that amount, you, Joe Smith, don't have to because the contract is between the supplier and your corporation, which is considered a separate legal entity from you. Wow, what a good idea. This is a risk management tool. So you say, okay, you do that, and you set it up, and... And lo and behold, it comes time to uh, <clears throat> uh, write out the check, and you do that. As we said, and you send it to the company, and then you open up your business, and you start making the product. And the next thing, something happens. Okay, we don't have to manufacture a problem anymore. We merely have to say COVID-19. COVID-19 happens, and you have to close down. You still owe the $80,000, so you close down for one month. Close down for two months. Close down for three months. The landlord wants the money. The employees want to be paid. You're laying people off. You're getting sued. You have no product to sell. You know, <clears throat> and suddenly, uh, you know, on August the 11th, you go, ha, ah, business is insolvent. I'm closing our doors. Sorry. Well, the uh, supplier, Manufacturing Supplies Corporation, is going to sue you or your company because it owes the money, and they will undoubtedly sue you, Joe Smith, as well. And when you get into court, you've got this corporate veil protecting you. The debt is with the corporation. The contract is the corporation's contract, not your contract. So far, you think you're okay. Then you're on the stand, and the judge takes the check, and he looks at it, and he goes, Okay, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, now this is the corporate check. Uh, uh, yes, uh, my lord. And uh, this is the business uh, name and address. Yes, my lord. And, and 
that's who you owe the money to. Uh, well, no, I don't owe the money. My corporation owes the money. Ah, okay. <clears throat> so the corporation owes the money. Why didn't it pay? Oh, well, you know, COVID-19, uh, disaster, uh, whatever. Um, nobody wanted the product, couldn't make the product, whatever the reason. You say the company cannot meet its contractual commitments. <clears throat> we have no income. It's defunct. And the judge says, oh, okay, then obviously the company owes the money. Mm. Who's that? Oh, uh, my lord, that's me, Joe Smith. I'm the president of the company. Oh, okay, you owe the money too. What? What do you mean? No, my lawyer said I've, I've got this, I've got this corporate entity here that says, you know, the, the contract has been in the company, the other company, and there's this cor corporate veil thing that protects me, and, and I signed it as the president and the officer of the company. I don't have any liability. And the judge said, yes, you do, because you didn't sign it correctly. And you go, no, 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 that's my correct signature. And the judge says, yes, but you did not sign for the company. You signed personally, therefore, you are liable. What you have to do to not be personally liable is to put per right in front of the name and the corporate name right there. And you can put the corporate names right there and I sign president. The judge says, not close enough. Okay? You're liable. You have to play, pay personally. All right, I'm just going to pause for one second. Okay, as I was saying, the judge says you did not sign correctly. What he meant was at the bottom of the check, oops, sorry, right here, you were supposed to sign it <clears throat> like this, ABC Manufacturing Limited, okay, per authorized signatory, all right? Now, per stands for on behalf of. So if you're signing on behalf of the corporation, then you cannot be signing personally and therefore you're not liable. But because he just signed it, then he was accepting personal liability. The judges will enforce that and will make you pay because they don't think it's particularly appropriate for business people to hide behind the corporation. Perfectly legal, but judges don't like it. So um, also, Authorized signatory. This is not absolutely necessary. Okay, as long as you've got per and then you sign, no personal liability. <clears throat> My attitude is don't do not give the judges any latitude, any discretion. You want to make sure that you pound that last nail into the coffin. Ooh, another bad um, analogy given the uh, current status of things. <clears throat> anyway, so I always tell my clients, put authorized signatory there. <clears throat> the banks will generally set up your checks so that the corporate name and authorized signatory and per are already there, and then you just have to sign it. So you should do it. Um, a few years ago, I had a very, very good client call up. They already had, I think, three corporations, and they were incorporating another one. I incorporated the company for them, and then I send them a reporting letter. And in that reporting letter, I would say specifically, remember, whenever you're signing on behalf of the corporation, you put the full corporate name, then you put per, and then you put authorized signatory. A couple of years later, they finally get around to activating, using the company actively, and uh, the client goes, oh, Peter told me how to how to sign the contract. It's like uh, you put a signature line and then under there you say per the company. Uh, yeah, close enough. So instead of having <clears throat> this and that there, he had it under the signature line and he signed there. He sent it to me and he said, is this okay? And I contacted him and I said, Dwayne, you have just signed saying you are available to be personally liable for the corporation. And he said, but, 
but you said to sign per. And I said, yeah, but the corporate name has to be on top, then per, then authorized signatory. If you put per, the name of the company, and authorized signatory underneath the line, it's not good enough. He said, but isn't it close enough? And I said, Dwayne, it's only close. Well, actually, I put it a slightly different way. I said, Dwayne, close is only good in horseshoes, nuclear war. Okay? So the idea is you do not want to give the judges any latitude. Now, I was a sole proprietorship when I was running my law practice at home. The bank very kindly sent me the checks with per an authorized signatory there. But they didn't know the name of the business, so they left that blank. So if I typed in Peter J. Holden Law Practice and signed here with authorized signatory and per, I'm okay, aren't I? No, I'm not. Because when you think about it, I'm a sole practitioner. I'm not a corporation. So there's no limited ink or corp here, right? So this line disappears. If there's no corporation that I'm signing for, the per disappears. I'm not signing on behalf of anything because the corporation doesn't exist. So I can't be an authorized signatory. So what's left? Well, my signature, so I'm personally liable. So a sole proprietor <clears throat> um, cannot use this method of preventing liability. Okay. Um, a partnership. I was in a partnership. I sign a letter. I put Mackay Turlock Holden per authorized signatory. I'm okay, right? No, because the corporation is not a separate legal entity. Okay? It's only if you go through the formalities of incorporating a company, which would end in limited, incorporated, or corporation, or LTD anchor corp. Okay? Then you're a corporation. Then you have this veil of liability protection. All right. Now that is the um, one... Con I we'll go over the other concepts, and we'll go over this too, but this is the one that I want you to remember from the opening lecture because it is relevant to the midterm exam, it'll be relevant to the contract assignment, it will be relevant to the quiz, and it will probably also be on your final. Now, last but not least, um, I have uh, 35 people enrolled in my class. I have 35 uh, spots um, officially from the university that have been filled, um, but the School of Business always takes one more slot for 36. And then I actually agree to take four more students, which means that five people on the wait list will be signed into my class. What I usually do is if you are in attendance on the first day of the lecture, <clears throat> you come to the front of the class, I take your name, I offer you a seat, you register. I don't have that luxury now. So I think what I'm going to do is, because I have these five extra spots, I will go to my wait list and I will make an offer to the first five people. If I make you an offer today, you'll get it tomorrow. They give you 24 hours. <clears throat> they give you 24 hours to register. If you don't register within that 24 hour period, I will make an offer to the next person on the list. And if three people that I send offers to don't register, then I will make offers to the next three people on the list. So at this particular point in time, <coughs> pardon me, I can't tell you whether you are going to get in or not, but my suggestion is keep attending, keep watching the wait list, Check your emails. If you're made an offer, go right down, register and pay, and then you'll be in the course. All right? And we only have a little while to do that. After that, um, <clears throat> it has to be done by uh, what they call forced registration or something, and it's less likely you'll get in. All right. 
Um, that concludes the first lecture. If there are any questions with respect to that or any of the materials, then please immediately email me and I will respond to you as quickly as possible. Thank you very much.